evening, everyone. Welcome to the virtual Mary Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Chris Agard, and I'm one of your three Ath Fellows for this year. In American public discourse, people tend to establish a dichotomy between Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, perhaps the two most famous activists in this country's history. This inclination to define the two as polar opposites sometimes makes us forget that they both fundamentally sought to combat the racism, injustice, and terror that permeate the United States. King always maintained the philosophy of nonviolence, but later in his life, he expressed an understanding for violent protest. Um, I imagine many of you are familiar with the minister's line, a riot is the language of the unheard. In mm -hmm. this speech, given less than a month before his assassination, King continues, and what is it America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last 12 or 15 years. It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. And it has failed to hear that large segments of, our white, of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than justice and humanity. Citing the violent demonstrations of the summers of the 60s, he says later in the speech that we must still face the fact that our nation's summers of riots are caused by our nation's winters of delay. As long as justice is postponed, we always stand on the verge of these darker nights of social disruption. Over 50 years later, after a tense summer of demonstrations and riots, this bold claim remains true. Our guest speaker tonight pushes back against comparisons of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X that reduce the nuances of their ideologies and of civil disobedience. Peniel Joseph is the Barbara Jordan Chair of in Ethics and Political Values at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas, Austin. His focus is Black Power Studies and is the founding director of the LBJ School Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. He also founded the Center for, for the Study of Race and Democracy at Tufts University, where he previously taught. Joseph's most recent book, The Sword and the Shield, The Revolutionary Lives of Malcolm X and Martin Luther Jr. was included on the Time 100 Must Read Books of 2020 list. He has written numerous other books. Professor Joseph will deliver the 2021 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. commemorative lecture. Using the Q&A function, we will accept questions throughout the program to be posed towards the end of the event. Preference will go to students, so when you send in a question, please state your affiliation with the college, student, faculty, parent, alumni, friend. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Professor Joseph to the virtual Athenaeum. Hey, thank you. Thank you for that great introduction. Um, very uh, privileged and honored uh, to be uh, the 2021 um, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, lecturer here at Claremont McKenna and at the Athenaeum. I wish we could be in person but it's really an honor to be here. Um, what I wanna talk about is um, Dr. King's legacy and reverberations in our own times in 2021, uh, but doing it through a comparison of Dr. King and Malcolm X. Uh, the, my, my most recent book, The Sword and the Shield is really based on um, a lifelong interest uh, in the civil rights movement uh, in the Black Power Movement, but also in a range of historical movements that affect uh, the local, the regional, the national, and the global. So I'm interested in race and democracy broadly. And I started out, when you think about a concentric circle, uh, looking at the Black radical tradition um, within civil rights, within Black power, uh, really from reconstruction all the way to the present, and as I've gotten deeper uh, into my studies, really as a student, I think that uh, one of us, uh, one of the things that uh, makes higher education so uh, fulfilling is that we get a chance to become lifelong students, even though um, some of us have been students for, for much longer than others. So they give us the label of expertise just so that we're not embarrassed. Um, and when you think about that lifelong curiosity, I'm really interested in King, Malcolm X, uh, and their impact on all these other different groups, uh, both religiously, politically, in terms of public policy, in terms of culture. So in a lot of ways, uh, my work on the Black Power Movement, the Civil Rights Movement, figures like Barack Obama, 
has really um, allowed me to uh, span and travel the world, both for research, but also uh, just as a, as a, as a student uh, and as a, as a um, scholar. Um, and so the sword and the shield, the revolutionary lives of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Really like Chris suggested, it pushes back against dichotomies of uh, Dr. King as the political shield and Malcolm X as uh, the violent political sword of the revolutionary black movements of the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, and in doing so, it really provides us uh, what I argue is a more historically contextualized basis for understanding Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Um, I start the book by arguing that when we think about King and Malcolm X, they start off as adversaries who become rivals, who over time become alter, become each other's alter egos. And that's really interesting. And I boil down what they are uh, arguing for and what they spend their lives fighting for to these two broad concepts that we can talk about in Q&A as well. And I know some people have had access to the book. Uh, for Dr. King, I argue he is talking about uh, radical black citizenship. And what I mean by that is that King expansively defines what he means by citizenship. Remember, King is one of the founding fathers of American democracy in the 20th century. And we have all these founding mothers and fathers of American democracy, uh, by the way, of all colors. Uh, and we can talk about that in the Q&A as well. But when we think about the 20th century and post-war America, King's idea of radical black citizenship is this idea of not just voting rights. He argues that citizenship is not just the absence of racial oppression, it's actual the visibility of actual justice in people's lives. He says that it's decent housing, fit for human beings, uh, a universal basic income, uh, a guaranteed job for all Americans, um, environments that are free of racial terror, uh, desegregation, because King makes the argument that we're all tied uh, in a single garment of destiny, uh, mutually, inextricably linked. So racial segregation both in public schools, but in neighborhoods, in societies, in our institutions and structures, ends up not just debasing those folks who become ghettoized and marginalized and are at the bottom of that caste system, but the entire society and democracy itself. Uh, so when we think about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., all the issues that we're talking about today, issues of food justice, issues of climate change, issues of anti-poverty, issues of mass incarceration, so many of these issues Dr. King braided together uh, during the course of his lifetime. So King was talking about radical black citizenship. In contrast, Malcolm X was talking about radical black dignity. And Malcolm defined radical black dignity as not just um, radical political, economic, cultural self-determination by black people. In other words, that black people were gonna be able to decide for themselves not only what was racist, but what anti-racism uh, uh, looked like. But he defined it as the, the end of what he called world white supremacy. Uh, for Malcolm X, uh, white supremacy was rooted in racial slavery. And the fact that racial slavery had created a caste system. Isabel Wilkerson has the best-selling book, Caste. And caste is a hierarchy, it's a ladder. Uh, it's the superstructure in a way of of racism in the United States and globally. Um, and it's not just in societies like India, we have a caste system here as well. And that caste system was first formulated legally, codified legally in public policy uh, through the system of racial slavery that's founded even before the Republic, but when the Republic is founded in 1776, we double down on racial slavery, the founding fathers uh, did so with the three-fifths clause of the Constitution uh, that gave uh, Southern states disproportionate power vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, elections in the conception of the Senate uh, by saying um, uh, Black people were going to be counted as three-fifths uh, to give them more density and more say and to keep the union, the fragility of the union um, going during the constitutional conventions. So when we think about, when we think about um, this idea of radical Black dignity. Malcolm also says that radical Black dignity means that Black people have to stop defining themselves 
through the lens of Western civilization. And that goes versions of beauty, intelligence, um, their own value system. So over time, what's interesting is that Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. come to see that you need radical black dignity and citizenship. Initially, Malcolm X is introduced to the world through a 1959 documentary series called The Hate That Hate Produced uh, as this idea of a, of, of a black supremacist, that the Nation of Islam is criticizing white supremacy, uh, but they're doing so almost as reverse racist. Uh, King initially believes that. That was not true, even though the Nation of Islam had its own uh, racial blinders. Uh, it, had its own, it's, it had its own problematic critique, but the Nation of Islam was hugely important in Malcolm X's development in terms of radical political self-determination, uh, uh, transforming um, prisoners, black prisoners who, who uh, were on the margins of even uh, African-American society. Malcolm, as Malcolm Little uh, is incarcerated from 1946 to 1952 uh, after really being a juvenile delinquent uh, for, for many years after um, suffering a number of different tragedies. His, his Malcolm X is from uh, Omaha, Nebraska, uh, raised in Lansing, Michigan. His father is killed tragically uh, when he's six years old. His mother is institutionalized. Malcolm becomes a foster uh, child. And uh, by the time he's 15 or 16, he moves to Boston. And really for the next 10 years, um, for the next five years becomes involved in a life of, of crime uh, selling marijuana to jazz musicians, uh, being parts of, of all kinds of illegal activities. And he's finally going to be arrested in 1940, end of 1945, and placed in prison from 1946 to 1952. And it's in prison that Malcolm Little becomes Malcolm X. And what's so interesting about Malcolm versus King, King's childhood is a lot less traumatic. So Dr. King is born January 15th, 1929 uh, in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, very interesting uh, because King is uh, the son of Martin Luther King Sr., the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church, and of course, uh, the first Black uh, United States Senator, Reverend Raphael Warnock, uh, presides over Ebenezer Baptist Church. So uh, there's a real connection uh, during today's third reconstruction with, with Dr. King's activism during the civil rights movement, which was really America's second reconstruction. And so when we think about Dr. King, January 15th, 1929, uh, son of Sweet Auburn Avenue, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. His father presides over one of the most important churches in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. King goes to Morehouse College, uh, one of the best schools in America, uh, both in the 1940s and now historically black college university. We know about HBCUs much more nationally now because of Kamala Harris, the first uh, Black and, and South Asian vice president in American history who graduated from Howard University. So when we think about King, when King is at Morehouse College as a sophomore, uh, Malcolm um, enters prison, three different prisons in Massachusetts. Uh, King goes to Crozier Theological Seminary after graduating from Morehouse uh, at the age of uh, 19. He gets his seminary degree and then gets a PhD from Boston University in 1956. And so for most of Dr. King's education, at least between uh, 1946 and 1952, Malcolm X is in prison. So Malcolm um, understands uh, the lower frequencies of American life. He describes America for black people as a searing racial wilderness. King initially is much more optimistic than Malcolm X. And so what's interesting about their public careers, Malcolm's is from 1952 to his assassination in 1965. Dr. King is from 1955 to his assassination in 1968. So those careers almost overlap and intersect when we see. King lives um, a little more than three years after Malcolm X's assassination, February 21st, 1965. Dr. King is assassinated Thursday, April 4th, 1968, 6 p.m. Memphis time. Uh, and when we think about Malcolm being paroled from prison August 7th, 1952, all the way to his death, these ideas of dignity and citizenship are, are hugely important. 
Malcolm X never advocates political violence uh, in the cause of liberation. What he does advocate is self-defense. And when we think about the NRA, when we think about gun rights, when we think about uh, Black people defending themselves against racial terrorism, it's only controversial, even as it's enshrined in the Constitution, if Black people do it. So this idea of Malcolm X as sort of this violent um, uh, foreboding figure uh, it becomes a, a, a real fantasy. Malcolm argues that Black people are being harassed by the Klan, by white supremacists, by the police, have a right, not just a right, a constitutional right and a civil right, but a human right to defend themselves. King is gonna be doing something different. King argues that the only way to transform American democracy is through nonviolent civil disobedience. King is influenced by his own Christianity here. He's influenced by Gandhi. Uh, he's influenced by a number of different um, thought processes. And he, he looks upon nonviolence as a discipline that allows for uh, shared struggle and shared sacrifice, but eventually revolutionary transformation. Uh, Malcolm is a Muslim. He's a Muslim uh, when he converts in prison uh, in the late 1940s, uh, by 1949. Um, and he's a Muslim when he takes the Hajj uh, and becomes a more orthodox uh, Sunni uh, Muslim in 1964. But really for the last 16 years of his life, he's a Muslim. Malcolm makes the argument that Christianity in the United States, Western Christianity is related to slavery, suffering and death and it's his Islamic faith that helped transform him from a juvenile delinquent who uh, took drugs, who smoked cigarettes, who uh, uh, imbibed alcohol into really the most uh, personally disciplined uh, activist of, of his or any generation. Uh, Malcolm X walks the talk uh, once he becomes a Muslim and what he tries to do by being that personally disciplined is make an argument that black people's liberation is gonna be found in the last place they care to look, which is within their own traditions, their own value system, and through, through political uh, and economic and cultural self-determination. By 1963, and I argue this in the Sword and the Shield, Birmingham in 1963 helps to radicalize King and Malcolm X. Uh, Dr. King leads a campaign to desegregate public facilities uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, and really to bring small d democracy to Birmingham, Alabama. Black people are living in substandard housing. They're victims of police brutality. It's in Birmingham that King is gonna write the letter from Birmingham jail after he's incarcerated for nonviolent peaceful protest. And in that letter, one of King's most radical letters, and it's showing you the radicalization of King, even as he remains nonviolent, he criticizes not just white conservatives and segregationists, he criticizes white moderates and liberals and says that he's been confounded by whites who are too interested in a unjust peace uh, than willing to have a, a movement that's gonna be disruptive of the status quo that is actually for justice. So it, it's very interesting how we see King becoming further and further radicalized in the context of Birmingham. And Malcolm is becoming further and further radicalized as he sees more political mobilization happening all across the United States. So Malcolm comes to have a much more, much more respect uh, for Dr. King. By 1964, Malcolm leaves the Nation of Islam and mostly he's leaving because of not only uh, the, the behavior of, of Elijah Muhammad, the, the, the leader of the Nation of Islam, but also he feels the group is not allowing him politically to organize and spread, uh, spread his wings. Malcolm had visited the Middle East in 1959. He was interested in anti-colonialism. He was interested in connecting the Black struggle for freedom in the United States with freedom struggles, not just in Africa, but all around the world, the so-called third world. Uh, when we think about Dr. King, even with the March on Washington, I Have a Dream speech, August 28, 1963, at that speech, King starts that speech by saying, now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. And throughout that speech, King 
really has a, a, a precise critique of American democracy and really a radical critique of American democracy. He says that they've come to Washington to cash a check. This is 250,000 people. It's a march on Washington for jobs and freedom. And he says, we've come to cash a check that has been stamped insufficient funds, but we refuse to believe that uh, the great vaults of opportunity in America are bankrupt. Uh, he criticizes Southern segregationists through that, throughout that speech. He says, Alabama is a state filled with vicious racists. He says that the, the governors in the South, their, their, their words, their lips are dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. Those were the words of the Confederacy um, at the dawn of the Civil War, interposition and nullification. The idea that states' rights meant that we were gonna have racial slavery in the United States forever and ever. Uh, King says that we're gonna have to struggle together. We're gonna have to organize together. But he also says we're gonna have to go to jail together. Dr. King realizes the depth and breadth of injustice in American society. He's still holding out hope that political reform like the 1964 Civil Rights Act, uh, July 2nd, 1964, like the, the, the August 6th, 1965 Voting Rights Act will, will be transformational, transformational enough uh, for really, like King says, justice to roll down like, like a mighty stream, King uh, uh, quoting the prophet Amos. And so when we think about King and Malcolm, by 1964, and the book starts with their only meeting on March 26, 1964 at the US Senate, they're both there in support of the Civil Rights Act that the US Senate is filibustering on March 26, 1964. Uh, in 1964, Malcolm is being interviewed by the journalist Robert Penn Warren, and he says that him and Dr. King have the same goals, and that goal is human dignity. Um, he tries to set up another meeting with Dr. King, with King's attorney, Clarence Jones, who Malcolm is also friendly with. Uh, he sends Dr. King a telegram offering his help uh, in St. Augustine, Florida, where, where King is uh, trying to desegregate the city of St. Augustine, Florida. And there are night marches and a lot of violence against peaceful demonstrators. Uh, and then finally, on December 17th, 1964, Malcolm X actually uh, goes to Harlem and, and, and listens uh, right next to one of King's lieutenants, uh, Andy Young, uh, the future UN ambassador and mayor of Atlanta, Andrew Young. He's sitting right next to Andrew Young as King is giving a speech uh, before 8,500 people at the Harlem 369th Armory uh, in New York City. And King has just won the Nobel Peace Prize. He's talking about his visit to Scandinavia. He's talking about how the United States needs a more social democratic system. And Malcolm speaks about that speech approvingly. And, and really finally, uh, February um, 3rd and 4th, Malcolm 1965, very shortly before his assassination, he visits Alabama, he visits Tuskegee, and then Selma, where King is. And King is in jail, he's in the local jail for leading a voting rights campaign, but Malcolm gets a chance to speak to Coretta Scott King, Dr. King's wife and his closest political partner, and they both give speeches, as does Andy Young. And Malcolm tells Coretta that he is there to support Dr. King, that he admires Dr. King, He's not there to hurt Dr. King. And he wants people to know that if black people don't get the ballot, there's gonna be, uh, uh, there's gonna be other alternatives that the nation's gonna have to face, uh, including and especially him. So when we think about this idea of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr., the sword and the shield, we see that during the course of their lives, they really um, embody both of those things. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna close by talking about uh, Dr. King in the last three years of his life. The last two chapters of The Sword and the Shield really deal with this um, um, at times on, almost in a granular way with chapters called The Radical King and The Revolutionary King. In the aftermath of Malcolm X's assassination, we really see King um, come into his own as this prophetic um, social justice uh, movement leader. Malcolm X had talked about turning the civil rights movement into a human rights movement, but he had criticized the March on Washington for not going far enough as the farce on Washington. He had said that folks should have paralyzed the entire city. After the Voting Rights Act, five days later, the Watts section of Los Angeles blows up 
uh, in one of the biggest urban rebellions of the 20th century as a result of police violence against the Black community in Los Angeles. And Dr. King writes an essay called Beyond the Los Angeles Riots, where he argues that even as he's won the Nobel Peace Prize and mayors are congratulating him, anytime he tries to advocate for civilian uh, police review, uh, civilian review over the police, anytime he tries to ad advocate for the desegregation of housing, anytime he, he tries to advocate for something that's gonna really be transformational, those same folks who had greeted him when he won the Nobel Prize, they, they shut their doors and they stopped answering his calls. And he calls for massive nonviolent civil disobedience that's gonna paralyze cities. And he says in that essay, we must use nonviolence as a political sword. And so what's so interesting about King, starting after the Watts Rebellion, King is going to stalk the United States like a pillar of fire for racial and economic justice. He's gonna break with the Lyndon Johnson administration. He's gonna come out against the Vietnam War. He's gonna march side by side with black power revolutionary Stokely Carmichael, who becomes one of his closest friends. He's always gonna push back against violence, but what's so interesting, we think about the Dr. King, Martin Luther King Jr. Riverside Church in New York City, April 4th, 1967. It's Dr. King who says that the United States is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. It's King who says that the three, the triple evils facing humanity are militarism, racism, and materialism. King argues that America has not shown the political maturity uh, to face the epic transformation that it must undergo. Um, King says it's gonna be a bitter but beautiful struggle uh, to build the beloved community. So when we think about King during the last three years of his life, his popularity diminishes because King is willing to call out presidents, the Congress, anyone who's not on the side of truth. King calls the United States to undergo a revolution of values, right? He, he talks about it. And when we think about what does he mean by that? Well, he makes the argument that a great nation is also a compassionate nation, that war, violence, and racism are inextricably linked with poverty, hunger, uh, and the marginalization and the ghettoization of so many different groups, especially Black people. So not only does King become the leading peace advocate in the United States, but he also becomes the leading advocate to eliminate poverty. And this is really, really ironic because he's doing this amidst the so-called great society in Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty. Dr. King argues that the war on poverty is being lost because of the country's uh, imperialist war in Vietnam. It's racist war in Vietnam. And when we think about this poor people's campaign, I think what's so striking is that King calls together black, Latino, uh, Native American and indigenous, uh, the whole rainbow coalition, poor whites from Appalachia to occupy Washington nonviolently until the United States is shamed into bringing about the end, and King means it, the end, the elimination of poverty by providing a basic floor of resources and healthcare and housing for every single American. And King does this through these history lessons and seminars. As a historian, I was really struck by both King and Malcolm's laser-like focus on racial slavery and the afterlife of racial slavery, how they linked movements for black citizenship and dignity to the caste system set up during racial slavery and also uh, that was set up after during reconstruction, convict lease systems that, that, that sentenced black people to prison for quality of life crimes and really uh, farmed them out and had them working for local companies uh, and, and municipalities, cities receiving uh, money for, for renting out convicts, uh, which, which, which really forced hundreds of thousands of black people uh, into a fate worse than slavery. Uh, the average uh, lifespan was seven years because you didn't have to take care 
of, of, of a convict the way you did uh, in the past uh, when, when, when Black people were considered property. Uh, the best book on this uh, is, is Slavery by Another Name by Doug Blackman, which won the Pulitzer Prize a few years ago. So th there's, there's so much here. And what King calls us to do, one other anecdote is in 1968, King is in Marks, Mississippi, uh, the, the poorest uh, zip code in the United States, Quitman County, Mississippi in the Delta. And King is in tears uh, listening to residents of Marx, Black residents talk about how their children have no shoes, they have no food, uh, the war on poverty hasn't reached them. And King, and there's great footage of this if people want to check this out, um, King says that the way they're living in Marx, Mississippi is a crime. And that's really, really important because Malcolm X had always argued uh, that the way in which Black people had, had, had experienced America, he had always charged uh, white America as Black America's prosecuting attorney uh, with a series of, of crimes against Black humanity that rooted that were rooted in racial slavery, but that evolved uh, over time, not just Jim Crow, but structural uh, and physical and political violence against the Black community. King starts speaking in the same words, but what King tells those folks in Marks, Mississippi is not only that it's a crime, how they're living, but he says, he gives them a history lesson about civil war and reconstruction. He says, after slavery, we were promised 40 acres and a mule, right? And that's the, that's the name of Spike Lee's production company, 40 acres and a mule. And instead of getting 40 acres and a mule, we got the convict lease system, sharecropping, peonage, the super exploitation of black labor, the dehumanization, the degradation, the demonization of black people. And what white people got was a Homestead Act that gave white immigrants and citizens uh, millions of free acres of land, right? And he, he compares and contrasts that and he says, these are the same people now who are telling you in Marx, Mississippi to pull yourselves up by your bootstraps. And King ends by saying, this is what we're facing, but we're, we're, gonna, we're not going to be defeated, right? So when we think about Martin Luther King Jr., this is this revolutionary figure, right? This is this nonviolent revolutionary figure who's, who's, who's asking us Who's, who's demanding of us this revolution of values to build a beloved community that's free of racial and economic injustice, right? To, 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 he's asking us, demanding of us to imagine uh, that, that justice is what love looks like in public, um, to walk the talk with our policies, to end violence, right? To end war, to end racism and white supremacy. And instead of making this Nobel Peace Prize winner even more popular, he's shut out from the White House. He's shut out from the New York Times. Uh, very famously, Whitney Young of the Urban League, who's a much more politically moderate, what we call centrism today, uh, uh, civil rights leader tells Dr. King after King comes out against the P Vietnam War, and Dr. King is being pilloried by the New York Times, pilloried by US Newsweek, pilloried by the press, right, left, center. He tells Dr. King, you did a mistake there, linking civil rights to the Vietnam War, that wasn't a smart move to make. And Dr. King tells Whitney Young, he says, Whitney, that may get you a foundation grant, but it won't get you into the kingdom of heaven. And what's extraordinary about that is that it goes back to what Dr. King says when he does the drum major speech and how he wanted to be remembered if he passed away at an early age, which unfortunately he did, as a drum major for justice. He says, uh, vanity asks what is popular, conscience asks what is right. And Dr. King is the one who teaches us about molding consensus, not, not, not telling people what they want to hear, but telling the nation what it needed to hear. So now more than ever, in the context of the January 6, 20. 21 uh, white supremacist insurrection at the nation's capital. And it's important, language is important, speaking truth to power is important. I've listened to media reports where people don't use um, the truthful language about what happened January 6th. January 6th was a white supremacist assault on the nation's capital by white supremacists who wanted to nullify the voting rights of black people in Atlanta, in Detroit, in Milwaukee, and other places, 
that gave the Biden-Harris administration um, uh, a, 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 a victory in the presidential election, but that also elected um, an African-American senator to, this, to, the, to the first time to, uh, to the US Senate in Georgia and, and the 33 year old Jewish American Senator John Ossoff. So what we're seeing right now is really what Malcolm X talked about in the aftermath of Kennedy's assassination, chickens coming home to roost. Uh, we are in the midst of a third American reconstruction. The first is between 1865 and 1896, where we see the passages of the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments that end racial slavery, that produce birthright citizenship and provide black men with voting rights. But what happens parallel to those um, epic legislative transformations is gonna be uh, white racial terrorism throughout the South. It's gonna be poll taxes and black codes. And it's also gonna be violent insurrections and racist pogroms in places like Texas, Memphis, Tennessee, South Carolina, Mississippi, New Orleans. Over 50,000 black people are killed from 1865 to the end of the century, much more than the five and 6,000 lynchings we talk about. Whole black towns are disappeared in this context to maintain white supremacy, the notion of the redeemer South, the notion of redemption in quotes. And that's how we get the lie of gone with the wind, the lie of birth of a nation, uh, the 1915 uh, D.W. Griffiths, what they're calling a classic that Woodrow Wilson watches in the White House and says it's history writ in lightning, where you have white actors in black face trying to rape white women. These are fantasies, right? These are, these are fa violent fantasies that predate QAnon, predate uh, uh, the hate groups that we see now. The origin story of, of, of the racial division and the hatred and the crisis of American democracy that we are all undergoing right now, we're all experiencing it in real time, it's connected with that history that we don't want to confront, but that Dr. King actually called us to confront. And that first reconstruction ends not just with the Plessy versus Ferguson decision in 1896 that says separate but un unequal, uh, is separate and equal is constitutional, uh, but it ends with a white supremacist insurrection in Wilmington, North Carolina, that, that harasses and murders and forces a duly elected interracial government to flee in Wilmington, North Carolina. So the last black congressperson at the federal level is going to be George C. White out of the South in 1901, who does the famous A Negro's Farewell Address to Congress. And we should all Google that. George C. White, A Negro's Farewell Address to Congress. And we're not going to see uh, black folks uh, represent uh, the South in Congress until the 1970s, people like Barbara Jordan uh, and, and, and others. Um, so when we think about Dr. King uh, and, and the first reconstruction, King is part of that second reconstruction. Sometimes we look at the period between 1954 and 1968 as the civil rights movement's heroic period between May 17th, 1954 and the, the Brown desegregation decision all the way up into King's assassination. And in between, we have these beats uh, like uh, Montgomery bus boycott, 1955 to 56, uh, Emmett Till's um, lynching in Money, Mississippi. Emmett Till's a 14 year old uh, black teenager who's murdered uh, for, for allegedly sassing a white woman in, in, in Mississippi. He, his body is gonna be found in the Tallahatchie River uh, with a 125 pound uh, cotton gin fan belt tied around his neck. His mutilated body, um, emasculated, shot up, uh, strangled, um, is going to be recovered. And his mother is going to allow an open casket funeral um, to let the world see uh, the horrors of white supremacy, the, the real horrors of white supremacy. And so when we think about those things, Emmett Till, Montgomery bus boycott, the Little Rock Central High School crisis, 1957, where federal troops have to come in um, so that Little Rock can be desegregated. Uh, Eisenhower has to send, send the military to Arkansas. Uh, 1960 is the start of the sit-in movements, February 1st, 1960 in Greensboro, North Carolina. 
And th that, that lunch counter is now a civil rights museum in Greensboro, North Carolina. But that sit-in movement launches the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, the integracial group of activists who are really your age, who go down to Arkansas and Southwest Georgia and Mississippi and Alabama and other places. And they really try to um, uh, institutionalize small d democracy uh, in parts of America where it absolutely does not exist because there is no such thing as second-class citizenship. And don't let anybody fool you when they use that word. It's a mistake, it's a misnomer. It's somebody who doesn't understand democracy. Democracies don't have classes of citizenship. So you're either a citizen or you're not. So when you can't vote, um, when you can't move freely, uh, when you don't have a roof over your head because of systems of structural violence, where you're more prone to get incarcerated and arrested and shot by the police, of course you're not a citizen. That's just obvious to any of us who are intelligent. Um, when we think about 1961, we see the Freedom Rides. 62, James Meredith becomes the first Black student to integrate Ole Miss, University of Mississippi. There's going to be three days of riding. 500 federal marshals are going to be called in. So to show you that second reconstruction and the violence of the second reconstruction, when we think about white supremacy, it's not just the new version we're seeing today, it's the white citizens councils. It's not just the Klan, it's the, it's the clergy that wasn't pro-civil rights, right? Um, by 63, I discussed Birmingham, but James Baldwin's The Fire of uh, the Fire Next Time comes out. It's the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, and on June 11th, 1963, John F. Kennedy does his very famous uh, racial justice speech where he says that it's a moral issue at hand and he's gonna call for civil rights legislation. A few hours after Kennedy's speech, the Mississippi civil rights activist Medgar Evers is assassinated by Byron De La Beckwith, a white supremacist who's not gonna be put in jail until the 1990s on federal charges because white supremacy is so deep and so thick they won't let a white man go to jail for assassinating a civil rights activist in 1963. That's how deep and rough and painful uh, this history is, right? Um, uh, King speaks at the March on Washington, but a few weeks later, he's presiding over three of the four funerals of the four little girls who are murdered by white supremacists at the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing uh, September 15, 16, 1963. And so, 64 is Freedom Summer and the Civil Rights Act and three civil rights workers are murdered during Freedom Summer, June 21st, 1964, outside of Philadelphia, Mississippi. Uh, Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, Michael Schwerner. But while looking for Schwerner, Cheney and Goodman who aren't gonna be found until August 4th, 1964, the FBI finds over five different bodies of black people in Mississippi, including torsos in Mississippi of black people who are being murdered in Mississippi in the United States of America in 1964, right? So that's the landscape that King is facing. So we talk about Selma by 1965 and Selma to Montgomery demonstration, and we wanna celebrate. We wanna say we have the uplifting speech at Selma uh, after Bloody Sunday, uh, future Congressman John Lewis is gonna have his skull fractured and cracked on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Lewis was the chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the youngest speaker at the March on Washington. He had also had his skull cracked as a freedom rider in 1961. We are so quick to say we wanna celebrate and Dr. King completes the march, March 21st to March 25th, but the level of death and violence during America's second reconstruction is echoed today. It's echoed today. So the king that we need is the revolutionary king who was calling us, challenging us, demanding of us to do better, demanding of us. In the letter from Birmingham jail, he says that the young people, over 1,100, who are being arrested for trying to desegregate the city of Birmingham, Alabama, are going to be one day remembered as heroes for, quote, what King says, returning this nation back to those great wells of democracy that were founded deep uh, by the founding, that were dug deep by the founding fathers, right? Those great wells of democracy. We live in a time period where we've got millions of Americans who don't believe in those great wells of democracy that were dug deep by the founding fathers. So the king that we have to embrace, yes, the nonviolent king, but he's a revolutionary. He was a revolutionary. He wanted us to change the structural and political relationships that we have with each other and that the state has with us 
but also that the United States of America has outwardly facing with the entire world, right? So I'll close by saying the, 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 the reason I remain optimistic amidst all the tumult and the turmoil that we're facing now um, is really because of the legacy of people like uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X and so many others, um, uh, Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, Angela Davis, we could talk about this for, for a long time. Um, but what King in, is, is so inspirational, the reason why King is so inspirational is that King really believes in America um, as a concept. King believes uh, in the democratic imagination. Uh, King loves America even when, uh, and he loved America, even when America stubbornly, uh, at times viciously, uh, refused to love black people back. Right? So King calls us towards these universal truths, but he wants us to achieve the universal through the particular experiences of black people in the United States. And that is so, so important, especially now that we are talking about anti-racism as a country. Uh, we've got a president who signed executive orders uh, centering racial justice, not just for black people, but Asian and Pacific Islanders indigenous folks, um, LGBTQIA, the whole notion of intersectional justice. King calls us towards that. King believed in intersectional issues. At the time, uh, intersectional identity uh, was there in terms of Black feminists, but King uh, was not well versed in that. And now we have amplified intersectional issues into intersectional identity and, 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 and justice. And that, that makes me feel optimistic and hopeful that if we continue to speak truth to power in the same manner of the revolutionary king, that we can actually uh, finally um, end systemic racism in the United States, uh, defeat white supremacy, and we should be using that word, we should be truthful when we speak, and, and finally um, achieve our country, which is a, a, a phrase that James Baldwin talked about in the fire next time, this idea of achieving our country for the first time, achieving the power and the promise of American democracy for all people, all religions, all colors of all backgrounds for the, for the very first time. We still have not yet um, achieved that. We've never even traveled down the, the, the positive truthful road towards uh, uh, racial truth, justice and healing, but, but we're on the precipice of, of being able to, to begin again and, and, and travel on that road. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, that was really excellent. And I'm excited to uh, have some questions from the audience, which we're gonna launch right into now. Our first question comes from a student who says that some black students express frustration with the way in which black people, issues and history are discussed in the college classroom setting outside of Africana studies courses Black Americans are often spoken of as an abstract concept, further dehumanizing them despite institutional efforts to diversify what is still white learning. How do you suggest that professors and non-Black students correct this frame of teaching, speaking, and thinking if you think that they can at all? Yeah, I think they can. I think there's a lot of things that we can do to leverage um, a, a much more inclusive uh, curriculum. I think um, it starts with with looking at ourselves um, inwardly, the organizations we're part of, our own personal networks, but certainly uh, our, our universities, whatever institutions we're at and seeing what are we doing, not only to be inclusive, uh, but to leverage not just uh, racial justice as an abstract, but, but black equality um, in that setting, right? Um, and we can do this in a number of different ways um, in terms of faculty, staff, students. Uh, one, representation matters. We see we've got a new White House with the most diverse uh, cabinet in presidential history. So representation matters. Uh, but representation linked to action really matters. So it becomes how is the university um, setting itself up to make for a much more inclusive curriculum beyond Africana studies? Um, is that through um, institutional lectures like this? Do you need to have them baked in more in terms of the whole, the whole uh, campus? Should there be um, a, a, a university-wide uh, book or books that we read from different perspectives, um, ideologically and politically, but that includes Black people? Um, how is the university leveraging its resources to impact communities, Black communities and communities of color right where it's at. So 
I think there's a lot of inventory that every single institution should be doing. And I would tell everybody to check out whitehouse.gov and look at those, read those exe executive orders. One of the things the executive orders do is call for um, a racial data assessment um, through agencies and to come back with a report in six months. Um, so, so see how people are doing when it comes to not just uh, broad things like diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm all for that. But I, I think that when we do that, if we don't specifically center Black equality, a lot of times we're going to miss um, um, real, real opportunities to leverage justice. So I do think that uh, uh, everything from student orgs um, to, to different professors can be incentivized uh, both through through resources that might be financial, but also resources that are also just personal resources and networking um, to make sure that uh, black issues and black scholarship is not isolated now more than ever, because obviously um, we've crossed the Rubicon in 2020 and 2021. So, so there's no turning back. Another question from a student asks, how do you think the politics of respectability contribute to disparities in understandings of Malcolm X and Dr. King's legacies? Yeah, I think that's a great um, question. I think, you know, respectability politics absolutely um, impacts this idea that, you know, uh, black people have to act a certain way. And, you know, in certain ways, Malcolm and Martin are both um, victimized by respectability politics, but at times imbibe and traffic in them themselves. You know, I mean, e e even somebody like like Malcolm, who certainly is has a critique of the petty bourgeoisie, talks about house Negroes versus field Negroes, uh, looks at King at times as Uncle Tom, um, but, but certainly has his own respectability politics vis-a-vis -vis, uh, issues of patriarchy and the roles of black women and black men that, that evolve over time. And Malcolm is coming close to a breakthrough near the end of his life, but that's definitely there. Uh, and then I think King in terms of respectability politics um, uh, certainly um, you know, imbibes those politics as well. And, and at times the public embraces King more than Malcolm because King is seen as a much more suitable figure uh, as the Christian preacher versus the Muslim uh, militant uh, in that way. So I think that, yes, it, it, it impacts them. But then I think there's other ways they go against the grain of respectability politics. Malcolm uh, and prison reform and prisoner rights and, and wanting to help people who are um, uh, drug addicted and on the margins. Um, King uh, and wanting to not just help the poor in a top down way, but uh, you know, King dies helping 1100 sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee who are on strike for a living wage. And right now, federal minimum wage is $750. They're talking about $15 all the way in 2025. Uh, those are starvation wages for, for, for many people. Um, and so I think respectability politics, it cuts both ways um, with them. Next question, also from a student, is who you consider to be the leader of the third reconstruction? You know, there's multiple. I would say that Black women, Stacey Abrams, uh, black uh, female um, um, athletes of the WNBA, um, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter activists, Alicia Garza, Tamika Mallory, Opal Tometi, uh, I think Megan Thee Stallion, No Name. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, you know uh, Amanda Gorman and, and, you know, the hill we climb. Uh, I think there's a lot of Black women who are uh, front and center uh, in terms of pushing intersectionality. Sherilyn Eiffel, uh, the head of the Legal Defense Fund. So you, d you definitely have to mention those names. And then there's Reverend William Barber. Um, there's, there's, uh, there, there's different um, folks who I, I really ad admire um, what they're doing as well. But I would put the BLM folks out there um, front and center. And then some of these um, elected officials uh, like Stacey Abrams, who, who, who uh, did so much. Uh, now, Reverend Raphael Warnock, um, is is right there too, uh, but there's 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 multiple. We don't. This is a generation that's not going to have a Malcolm Martin, Angela Davis per se. Um, it's it's uh, it's richer than that. There's way too many to count, um, and they're regional, national, global. 
Next question comes from a student um, that asks, the Democratic Party time and time again allows and fosters white supremacy in many ways. Mm -hmm. Malcolm X and Dr. King protested that white liberal institution. How can we learn from how they navigated fighting the party while also approaching the Democratic Party as a, as a necessary ally, if at all? Yeah, you know, um, that's that's absolutely true. Uh, you know, there's not going to the, the the Democratic Party has its own um, issues, and uh, I think what you have to do is what we've seen people like um, Cory Bush and Ayanna Presley and Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and just others try to have a different image of the Democratic Party and say, hey, this party should center anti-racism, should center anti-poverty, should center um, uh, you know, black and brown women uh, who disproportionately head poor households in the United States uh, should be about trying to eradicate patriarchy, eradicate homophobia, transphobia, queerphobia, you know, all these different things, I think. Uh, but I also think that as we've seen, when you only have one major political party that is um, pro-democracy, I do think that you have to think strategically in how you organize. That's the best way to say it. You have to be strategic about that. So I think, I thought in 2016, there were people who um, I had big arguments about in terms of who, who to vote for. And um, I thought the answer was obvious in terms of um, uh, the Democratic Party, Hillary Clinton, but other, other people disagreed, you know? So, um, and they disagreed for their own reasons. They, they didn't go rightward. They were actually further left than Hillary. And I completely understood that. You can be personally further left than a candidate, uh, but vote for them because of strategically, you're trying to do what Dr. King tried to do. We're all trying to be, I think, at our best service oriented leaders. And that means setting aside your ego. It means setting aside your personal wants and needs for a larger good. So the reason why in 2016, I didn't sit out the election I didn't write in a candidate. I didn't. I, I felt that if if Hillary Clinton was not elected, that the 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 her opponent represented an existential threat to democracy. I felt that that person was going to get a lot of people killed, um, and a lot of people were going to die and suffer. Four years later, whether we're talking about the COVID nineteen pandemic or children dying uh, in cages in ICE, I think a lot of people fail to take their egos out of it. And I think one of the best lessons that Martin Luther King gives us is a lesson of somebody who's a, a, a flawed figure, shortcomings like all of us, but, but who is a hugely humble figure, or somebody who comes in with deep humility. So uh, if we're thinking strategically, think about, when you're thinking with deep humility, think about the person who can't be on a call like this, who doesn't have the access that you have, um, and, and think about centering them and their children and, and, and what party is gonna provide something for them. That, that's what you do. Not, not checking all your boxes and what you want. Uh, and that takes a lot. It takes setting our ego aside and that can, that can be hard um, um, a lot of the times uh, for people who are active because we can't confuse uh, a righteous cause with self-righteousness, right? So a righteous cause allows us to, to, to be humble, uh, to be grateful, to live with gratitude. And self-righteousness uh, means that we're the know-it-all and everybody else is wrong, right? So you want a righteous cause, but you don't want to be self-righteous. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you for asking or for answering all of our questions or not all of them, unfortunately. We don't have time to ask all of the questions. But, oh, let's, do, um, let's do one more, Chris, let's do one more. Okay, Will, you wanna ask? Sure, uh, this question comes in from an alumnus who says that uh, he was interested by the point in your book at how much both men were influenced by their trips abroad and their involvement with political movements in other countries. Do you think that the current civil rights activism is as transnational in scope as what Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were trying to achieve while they were alive? You know, I think it's transnational in scope now. And I think we saw that with the Black Lives Matter protest in 2020 that reached Munich and Berlin and Nigeria and England and just the entire world. Um, and, and, you know, movements in the Middle East and in Africa and in India and all around the world, movements that are for human rights in Europe. Um, so yeah, I do, I do. I think that 
um, there is this global movement that is connected to what we see here in the United States, where folks who are indigenous peoples and black peoples and women and poor people are um, inspired by our movements here and we are inspired by their movements there and that we actually are in good communication and in good um, contact with each other as well. Obviously the pandemic precludes travel right now, but I do think it is as um, transnational. I think the fights are a little different because King and Malcolm waged these fights uh, against colonialism. And what we've seen is now uh, we're in a post-colonial, uh, not so much post-colonial, but sort of a neo-colonial uh, stage. So um, we don't have the same kind of uh, colonialism that we had in the mid 20th century, but we still have the unequal power relations that we have. So in, in a lot of ways, uh, uh, places in the third world that were supposed to be able to be transformed uh, still have real major um, um, archipelagos and centers of poverty that at times force um, immigration back to the former metropole. So you see immigrants trying to go to France, immigrants trying to go to Ireland, trying to come to the United States. Uh, some of those folks who are coming here, we are deeply implicated in why they want to come back <laughs> or why they want to come here. We're deeply implicated because of the Cold War, um, our foreign policy in Central America, Latin America, the Caribbean, at times invasions in Grenada and other places. And we're not the only ones who are deeply implicated, Europe is as well. So we're all living um, in the context in the shadow of neoliberalism. I think one of the most interesting things is people saying that how can we have a world that is much more just, um, that has less boundaries, uh, but we think of this global idea of citizenship and human rights for all people. So I think that's really, really remarkable. I think. Dr. King talked about this and called us towards it. And I'm, I'm really excited about the global possibilities, uh, especially now that we, we, we've we had uh, a new administration, uh, what, how we can all sort of redefine and reimagine human rights where um, our moral circle is not just as small as ourselves and our families, but is as wide as the entire planet. Well, thank you so much. I, that was a really great answer. So I'm glad we'll ask the question. Do you have any closing remarks, Professor Joseph? Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for allowing me the privilege, the honor to uh, be with you for the last hour. Um, like I said, I remain optimistic. I think that uh, I'm privileged and honored and always grateful to be allowed to be a student, to be allowed to teach, to be allowed to write. Um, we are undergoing and living through historic times uh, it's important to be a part of it as just an active citizenship, as an active citizen rather. Um, um, think about what Dr. King called the revolution of values in terms of us being more empathetic, us doing the inner work and being the inner light uh, that we can shine externally that we wanna see. Uh, if we become what we wanna see in the world, we help. Uh, Bobby Kennedy talked about ripples of hope uh, and every ripple of hope becomes um, uh, it turns into potential wave and, and maybe a tsunami of justice. Uh, and so I'm, I'm still very, very optimistic. And I think that all of us have to um, uh, read, uh, you know, organize, uh, educate, agitate, um, but be optimistic too. We cannot afford cynicism. You have to get involved. Um, we're all part of this country, whether you're an American citizen or not. Uh, you you have value. You're you you've got you've got global citizenship, <laughs> human dignity, right? Um, so we're all part of the solution of creating a more just society. And I do think that we can build that beloved community, really, even in our lifetime. But we have to want it, and we have to work for it, and we have to work for it in a way that goes beyond our own personal egos, our personal aggrandizement, and think about the larger community um, and and expand our moral circle. Uh, to beyond our kinship, uh, our family, our blood ties, our friends, um, to to go and include the entire entire planet. Well, 
Thank you. On behalf of Claremont McKenna College and the Athenaeum, thank you all for joining us tonight. A special thanks to Professor Joseph and to all those who sent in questions. Don't forget to join us for our next virtual app event, which will be on Tuesday, February 2nd at 5 p.m. Pacific. CMC professors Hillary Apple, Lily, Lily Geismer, and George Thomas will lead a panel discussion on an American democracy in crisis. Thank you and have a good evening.